Oscar, it's a, a, a big pleasure to stay with Oscar, with Mehmet, with Honor, with Visotti, and all our colleagues, Dr. Thomas, and thanks for having uh, inviting me. The topic is the role of posterior fossa decompression in different types of basilar imagination. This is uh, my city. As long as you know, the, the, the South Hemisphere has only a third of all lands in the world. We live in a big city, as the, the cities in, uh, in Turkey, you are all invited to come to see our country. Basilar invagination, there is a lot of confusion uh, in the diagnosis and treatment. And even now, recently, many informations appeared in the scene, and we must choose which kind of operations we should do. It's a, a big problem now. New forms of treatment have been advocated. A summary evaluation suggests that the sample of pathologies treated are different in several parts of the world. Now we are working with Oscar uh, and, and with uh, Dr. Jörg Klickham from Germany. We are studying the difference in the samples throughout the world. That seems to be very different. We are trying to understand the classification of all craniovertebral malformations. We did a research to understand the distribution of, of pathologies based uh, on the literature. We did a systematic review using the terms Arnold Chiari, malformations or Chiari, basilar invagination, and atleto axial dislocation. Several parts of the world prefer to term the term uh, atlanto axial dislocation. And we selected only papers describing samples of patients with pathology to understand the difference of the, of the disease throughout the world. And we selected 4,708 described the case from every part of the world. And we, we were able to find and to, to put the groups under unstable and stable cases. The unstable case came mainly from China and India and some centers studying uh, children in the US and the stable case came from the other parts of the world. When we look at the unstable cases, the unstable are composed mainly by children and male uh, patients, predominantly. Then we can put all malformations under unstable and stable umbrella and in unstable, it's possible to, to separate basilar invagination type one or A, according to Goel, atlantoaxial dislocation with absence of detached odontoid process, and atlantoaxial dislocation with normal bones, probably is a ligament problem. This disease is more rare and has been discussed. And in stable branch, we can divide into all forms of Chiari, all types of Chiari malformation, and type two basilar invagination or type B, as you prefer. Here are examples of type one basilar invagination in which the assimilation of the anterior arc of atlas is the predominant problem and odontoid goes through MacRae's line. And uh, instability that we can quote uh, by atlantic cell dislocations are really dislocations with odontoid malformed or only dislocated. And here, type two basilar invagination 
as we know that everyone knows. The topic that we will talk today is type one or unstable and type two uh, stable basilar invagination. It's very important to remember, and I will show three uh, slides. Uh, remember the normal anatomy. In normal anatomy, the arc of C1 is in front anterior to the basal, and the odontoid process is in line to the basal. And there is a distance from the basal to odontoid in every normal uh, citizen. Uh, anterior arc, anterior to basal, odontoid in line to basal. This is a, a magnification and other example. Only to remember, odontoid in line with basal, anterior arc of C1 ahead or in front of the, the basal. And there is always a distance between atlas and the skull. Always will have a distance, a normal, a normal space. A, magnif a magnification only showing the distance between C1 and C2. The normal basal is, uh, sorry. The normal basal is in line with odontoid. In the left, we have a Chiari malformation with tonsil herniations. The anatomy, the angular anatomy, are very similar to normal subjects. C C1 atlas uh, is far from the skull. Odontoid is in line with the basal similar to the normal ones. Okay. At the left, we are another case with tonsil herniation and the anatomy is very close to normal. At right, we have a typical case of type two basilar invagination. We cannot see the posterior arc of the siun that is assimilated to the skull. This bring atlas very close uh, to the skull in an upper part. And this helps to, to create the craniocervical kyphosis. Then atlas is in the upper part, different from Chiari and from normal uh, citizens. When we have an anterior arc assimilation, that is very common in type one invagination. And here is the posterior arc assimilation. Then the atlas is closed, is joined to the skull. This brings the odontoid to an upper part. But if you remember atlas and odontoid process in normal citizens are closed one to the other. The problem is not uh, the height of the odontoid, but atlas is the problem in these diseases. When we look at type two basilar invagination, here is the simulation of the posterior arc of atlas that brings the atlas to an upper position. Then again, atlas is the problem. We did a systematic review from several control uh, studies showing where is the atlas in normal population. Atlas uh, related to violation of Chamberlain's line. Atlas normally is not above the Chamberlain line. Uh, at the maximum, it may be at the Chamberlain line. Then the atlas above the Chamberlain line is an abnormal pathology. When we uh, study all our samples of types one and two basal invagination, 52% of those are composed by type one, uh, almost 30% by type two, and uh, almost 20% by type two, but with normal atlas and axis not assimilated. 
Then the assimilation of Atlas in our understanding uh, is responsible for the greatest majority of this disease. It's a big problem in, in basilar invagination. When we look at uh, our samples with type one basilar invagination, we can see several forms or types of assimilation. There is assimilation with almost horizontal plywood and the skull is bent to the front. There is a simulation with a distance between C1 and C2. Uh, there is a simulation in which, in, in which the odontoid is stopped by the skull, by basal, and several other types of dislocations uh, uh, in type one basilar invagination. When we look at type two basilar invagination, uh, the anterior arc is not assimilated, but the problem is the assimilation of posterior arc that also brings the atlas to another uh, upper part. Then uh, it's very frequently the assimilation of the posterior arc of C2. In 60% of type two basilar invagination. But, there are some cases that if we don't look closely to the bone deformity, we would consider this as a type two basilar invagination. But when we look at the bone anatomy, there is an, uh, an atlas assimilation and, and an upper migration to the odontoid. This that we would consider at first a type two basilar invagination is really a type one. Then the bone anatomy must be studied specifically in all types of basilar invagination. Other, other basilar invagination type two. And when we look at the bone anatomy is really a type one basilar invagination. We study specifically the relation of atlas patterns in this malformation, the constant problem in type one is anterior arc assimilation, and in type two, a posterior arc assimilation. In normal development, when the, uh, the C1 is closed joint to the basal and to the skull, uh, the odontoid becomes posterior and, and atlas are not migrated to the anterior part. After uh, the severance line, the separation between the cervical spine and cranium, the skull bends to the posterior part and C1 goes to the front. Then Atlas became anterior to basal and odontoid in line to the basal. This is important for the diagnosis. The assimilation of the anterior arc of atlas prevents the retropositioning of the skull in relation to the atlas. Keeping the C1 in line with basal and not on quite projected to the foramen magnum. I insisted abroad uh, in this concept because this, import, this is important to the diagnosis. But uh, as you can see here, C1 and C2 uh, are in a, in a normal relationship. C1 is not in the upper part. What is migrated to the upper part is C1. In embryology, there is a suggestion that uh, Hox genes are responsible when the occipital Hox genes are not well formed. The, uh, the Hox genes from cervical spine become uh, make the, the work by the cranial hox genes. And when the cervical spine does not work well, the skull try to make uh, the work by cervical spine hox genes. Then this explanation can explain uh, basilar invagination and all forms of malformations that occur in cranial cervical junction. These two diseases 
may be separated by another classification and not put all the forms uh, in the umbrella of uh, Atlantic cell dislocation. But there are other, uh, other important phenomena that occur. These cases are frequently accompanied by plectibasia. The base of the skull does not bend adequately and frequently uh, dumps the head to the front with a flexion of, of skull cervical spine uh, uh, limits. Here is the kind of plectibasia that can occur in this disease. When we look at uh, in basal vagination, at the relationship, the angular relationship between the skull and cervical spine, patients with basal vagination have a cranial cervical kyphosis. Perhaps this must be put into consideration in the treatment. This is a flexion of the skull and cervical spine and can be translated into results. Uh, there is a suggestion that not only the occipital make part of this problem, but the sphenoid bone is important in basal invagination. It's something that we are looking at just now. And also, uh, brachycephaly, when we study type two basal invagination, there is a, a straight relation to, the, to the, the shape of the skull and very more frequently in patients with a brachycephaly. We study these relations also. And what we could understand, type two basal invagination are frequently brachycephalic uh, persons. The skull is rounded very frequently, suggesting brachycephaly. And uh, the topic, how do I treat these this patients? First, unstable cases. We published this paper almost 20 years ago, and uh, our intention was to, 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 to demonstrate that several situations that were considered previously as part of the basal invagination could be normalized with traction and realignment of the skull. The basion uh, may become not horizontal, but vertically. And the cervical spine uh, could lose the, the high hyperlow torsos and become more straight when the head becomes more, uh, more normalized by traction or by surgery. And we propose that a cranial cervical fixation could treat not only the cervical spine, but the head in relation to the cervical spine. This is a pre-op after the simulation, that is the rule. Posterior fossa decompression, treating syringomyelia and Normalization, uh, even the, the torque, uh, the tentorium became normalized when we realigned the head, suggesting in that time that the skull bending could make part of the pathophysiology of this disease. It is a, a schematic, uh, uh, a diagram showing a uh, hetero uh, position of the skull and verticalization of the clivus, making part of the treatment of this disease. And here is another publication showing that only with head extension, the atlas and axis can be put in the normal situation. And probably here, we don't need to distract C1 and C2, only to fixate it in the normal uh, uh, and, and now normalized position. This is a, a cranial cervical fixation. And more recently, we have stopped the cervical fixation in C2 to permit the, the cervical spine to get a normalized position and to control the basal. This is a, a type one basal invagination, a simulation of the posterior 
uh, arc of atlas, it make part of the skull. Then if you fixate the skull or see you see one, uh, there is no, no matter because uh, the mechanical effect will be the same. And the fixation is stopping at the upper cervical spine, if possible. And associate it to the compression of the posterior arc assimilation. We don't realize in a smaller decompression. We think that the posterior fossa must be decompressed in the normal position of the patient. Type two basal invagination, uh, and Chiari malformation, even Chiari one or a small tonsillar herniation because the occipitalization of the atlas frequently stops the tonsil herniation and compresses more the posterior fossa. This case has been in our experience being successfully treated by posterior fossa decompression. Even with ventral compression, we, we get size for the posterior fossa. Uh, even the bending uh, of the spinal cord can be normalized when you get space to the posterior fossa. One case, a ventral compression, posterior compression, tonsil, tonsil herniation, and becomes more normalized with CSF flux in front and behind and cisterna magna recreation only after posterior fossa decompression. There is now a, a try to increase the clivus canal angle in type two basal invagination. There are only two papers that I know trying to, 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 uh, to make a fixation type two basal invagination. They got a, a small increase in, in, in ventral angles in ventral compression. But nowadays, they, the amount of information is very small. And if associated with brachycephaly and platybasia, we don't have this information until now. C1, C2 distraction and fixation. We have some, some concerns when associated to clivus horizontation, or horizontalization and cranial cervical flexion. What is the effect of C1 and C2 distraction in case like that? Or in case with an horizontal uh, clivus? Well, we probably could not uh, bring the skull to a more uh, normalized position. But in this case that we have uh, the C1 and C2 normalized, but only C1 in the upper portion. If we make a distraction, we will do this, put the odontoid to then a, a more uh, down situation, then is normal. Then our suggestion is to realign, to decompress the posterior fossa and fixate with a decompression of the posterior arc of C1 uh, assimilated. The majority of these patients have a narrow posterior cranial fossa and we decompress all of them. When to use C1, C2 distraction and fixation only without decompress. In these situations, we have some current concern to do that. There is one specific situation that we consider that this will be um, uh, effortful, is the atlas shrugged. I, uh, I think that you know this, this kind of disease is a bending to the, the, the side of the skull in relation to, to the cervical spine. When you look in the sagittal image, the migration of the odontoid is very high, probably because you have a, a sagittal image uh, in the school, in the, the down part of, of, the, of the sagittal reconstruction. 
in this case, probably the distraction in, in some case like that, that you really need to bring the odontoid to a lower part. In this case, the distraction will be very suggestive. Then in basilar invagination, we consider the patterns of atlas assimilation, cranial cervical flexion, horizontalization of plywood, plaquebasia, brachycephaly, the tightness of posterior fossa and cervical spinal canal, and posterior fossa decompression has been the rule for, for us until now. We can remember that there's no randomized trials comparing several techniques. The amount of cranial cervical realigned techniques published is much greater than C1, C2 distraction techniques. There's more literature uh, with occipital cervical uh, fusions than C1, C2. Even the published results are not clear. Frequently, we cannot see the results in the papers. There's no data over the superiority, superiority of C1 techniques over the compressive or cranial head cervical alignment techniques. The effect of skull and head mobilization should not be neglected. Neither of the C2 nerve section, we don't know the results, neither the long-term results of any of these techniques. Until more results appear, superiority of any technique should be considered elusive. Well, uh, I, I finished my data and I'm happy to, to discuss with you. Thank you for your attention. Th thank you, Ricardo. It was really an amazing lecture, amazing experience you have from substantial number of patients you, you have in Brazil. And also from your literature review, you are really a great expert on this. So, I mean, this was really interesting uh, what you told us um, because you told us that atlas can be the problem or one of the problems, platybasia, uh, brachycephalia. Uh, whereas Professor Gu from India, he focused a lot on on uh, on the joint, on C1, C2 joint. And my impression is that we were talking somehow on different diseases. And that's why it doesn't show any, any superiority of any technique in, in, in different trials, because we are talking about different, uh, totally different patients. So um, there, are, there are some questions here. I, I would like to, to open to, to uh, for, from the audience, if, um, if there are any questions. Uh, you know, I noticed that you, you always, when you do some fixation, you always go for a C0. Is this for a, any technical reason? You know, you avoid C1 because of any 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 danger of the vertebral artery anomaly or you want to play safe? Uh, is it related to the physiopathology that you can correct by, by, by some of the retropulsated head? Um, you know, just, just explain a little bit more why you, you're not intervening more on C1. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I think that you only know what you see or what you have in your hands. I began studying the alignment between the skull and cervical spine. And uh, I showed, at least for myself, that the skull is bent uh, to the anterior part, to the back. Uh, and we can realign the skull and cervical spine, fixating the skull. I don't know until now if we can do this, that distraction C1 and C2. Then which is the case for only distract or fixate C1 and C2? And which is the case for uh, stopping in C0? In my patients, the majority of them have cranial cervical kyphosis, have uh, uh, a clivus horizontalization. Our patient suggests that we need to realign the skull, but only the results we show the truth for us, Oscar. 
Right. No, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely true. Uh, my only concern when you do a C0, C2 fixation without going further down, your leverage arm is too big. So you have run into problems in revision problems in pull out screws in, you know, I think it's a very short construction with a long lever for, for the, for the rod. Uh, you, you see my point? Again, I think that you are right, but uh, P2 is, is, is uh, excluding C2 is a, a very strong fixation, but I agree. There is a, a, a big arm, but if you fixate to the lower part, you will lose the ability of the cervical spine to compensate uh, uh, your balance, the balance that you have created. That's the reason that we bet on stopping in situ and letting the patient to normalize their sagittal balance. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Whenever you have uh, low doses in, in lower cervical spine, you have kyphosis C0, C2. So this kind of uh, compensatory mechanism needs to, to be, uh, to exist. I, I agree with you. So is there any other questions for, for uh, from uh, the panel or from uh, the audience? Um, 